last week? Y'all have your weekend? Y'all ready for another week of school? No. <laughs> Y'all got a long way to go, don't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the good thing about me? I'm done with school. I ain't never going back. Uh, I'll talk to y'all about something. I have two dogs in my house. And their names Buster and Remy. And Buster, we've had a little bit longer than Remy, but we got both of them when they were puppies. And when they were puppies, you know what we tried to do? We tried to start start teaching them the things that we wanted them to do, like sit, you know, when call them on the cone, and like to go to the pen and things like that. You know, over time when they grew to understand us and grew to love us and, and we continue to do do uh, discipline and different things in their life, over time, guess what? All we have to do is say, Buster, Remy, sit, and guess what they do? They sit. If we tell Buster Remy to come, they come. I mean, even Matt, I mean, if he goes outside and says, Buster Remy, go to the pen, you know what they do? They both take off and they go to the pen because they listen to what we have to say. I'm not saying that we are like pets or that we are like puppy dogs or anything, but there's a good, there's a good lesson to be learned there because God in His Word, 1 John says this, if we love God, we're going to do what He calls us to do. And you know, as we grow, we learn more things about God, don't we? We grow to understand Him a little bit more. We grow, to, we grow to know that He loves us and He desires for us to do what? To obey Him. And so as we grow and we get to learn more about God and our love grows for Him and, His, and we learn how much He loves us, when God tells us to do something, we should do what? We should do it. If He says go over there, we do what? We go over there. If He tells us to go this way, we do what He tells us to do, right? Simply because we know that He loves us and He wants the very best for us, okay? So open up your word, open up the Bibles, read it like you're supposed to, and you'll begin to see the things that God wants you to do, okay? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for the direction that you give us. Father, you tell us in your word that if we'll just trust you, that you'll lead God and direct our lives, Lord. And you want to do that because you love us so, Lord. And I pray that these uh, young young little men and this young lady, Lord, that they'll continue to realize how much you love them how much you want them to live for you, Lord, and each and every day they will grow closer to you and they'll do more for you tomorrow than they did the day before. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen.
Take your copy of God's Word and turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, we'll be looking at the first 10 verses this morning. Acts 3, 1 through 10. As you're turning there, the title of the message this morning is, What do you have to give? What do you have to give? Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. You found your place in God's Word, say Amen. Amen. The Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, and they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Who see Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew it was he who sat begging for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for the honor and the privilege that you give to us to be in your house on this day. Father, we are thankful for the songs of praise that we've already lifted up into your holy and good name, Lord. We pray that the singing was acceptable and beautiful in your sight today, Lord. And Father, we pray that the preaching of your word will be acceptable in your sight today. And Father, we know that all is vain unless the Holy One comes down. So we pray right now for your anointing and your blessing upon this place, Lord. We pray for souls to be drawn to a Savior. And Lord, we pray for a church to be on fire for the glory of God. So speak to us this morning as only you can, Lord, from your word. And we'll give you the praise, honor, and credit for it. And it's in Jesus' name that we humbly but also boldly pray. Amen. What do you have to give? On the job, we give our time. On the ball field, we may give our hustle. On birthdays, we offer gifts. On Valentine's Day, which is just a little over a week from now, we may give a card, flowers, chocolate, jewelry, or we might take our significant other out for a nice dinner. But as a child of God, as a child of God, what do you have to give? What do I have to offer others? I believe that question is answered rightly for us here in Acts chapter 3. Going back to Acts 1, Jesus gave a promise. He told his followers that they should wait and if they would wait, that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit had come upon them. And when they received this wonderful gift, they would be witnesses for Him wherever they went. And in Acts 2, we see that Jesus kept that promise. And once that promise was received, once the Holy Spirit came to the life of those disciples, they began to share. And not timidly share, they shared with boldness and power the life-changing gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are told in Acts 2 that Peter stood up and he began to proclaim the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And when Peter shared the gospel and allowed the gospel of the Holy Spirit to do their work, the result was simply this. Lives were changed. 
Conviction failed. Repentance occurred. And around 3,000 people, according to Acts 2, placed their trust in Jesus for salvation. What a glorious result. And what a wonderful testimony of the work of the gospel. Remember what I shared last week. The gospel still works. But it's up to the church to still work the gospel. The gospel still works. We just need to work the gospel. We need to be in the sharing business with a lost and dying world. And now we come to Acts chapter 3. And we are told that Peter and John, two of Jesus' disciples, are headed to the temple around the ninth hour for prayer. This night hour was around 3 in the afternoon. And why were they going? Well, it tells us here in the scripture that it was the hour of prayer. But if we was to go on just a little bit further in Acts 3 and Acts 4, we see that they're going to share. They're once again going where the people have gathered so they can share what? The good news of Jesus Christ. And on the way to the temple, we find out that there's somebody else. That there is a man who is lame. He didn't get crippled in life. He came into this life crippled. He came into this life vain. And the Bible tells us that he was carried to the temple on a daily basis. And he was laid at the gate called Beautiful. Many biblical historians believe that this gate was the gate that separated the court of the Gentiles from the court of the women. And according to the Jewish historian Josephus who lived during these times, this particular gate was made out of Corinthian bronze and it was so large that it would take 20 men to open and to close it. So again, picture this. Peter and John on the way to church. And on the way to church, there is this man who is lame, crippled since birth. This lame man was hopeless. From the text, again, it seems that he was brought here nearly on a daily basis because he desired the mercy of others. And as he sat there at the mercy of others, the text tells us that he is doing one thing. He is begging. He's asking people for arms. He's begging those who are entering the temple on this day. And on this particular morning, as Peter and John were about to pass by, guess what the beggar did? He asked Peter and John for some help. He asked them for some money. Now, friends, before we go any further, this was a legit need. This man was in need. He was crippled, and he was at the mercy of others. This wasn't somebody randomly walking up to him, to them at the gas station, asking for a $20 bill for gas, and as soon as you give them that $20 bill, they're walking inside and buying some booze, some wine, or some liquor. This man had a legit need. And when he asked Peter and John for help, verse 4 says they fixed their eyes on him. They fixed their eyes on him. This word fix is an interesting word because in Acts 1, it's the same word that describes the apostles as they gaze at Jesus as he ascended back up into glory. As he ascended back up into heaven. Needless to say, this beggar had these apostles undivided attention. So they fixed their eyes on him. And then all of a sudden, Peter, speaking for both me and John, said, Look at us. Look at us. The beggar probably thought that this was the moment he was about to receive that monetary donation that that he wanted or he needed for that day. Yet Peter quickly dashed his hopes against the rocks and he, the first words out of Peter's mouth was this. Silver and gold, money, we don't have it. We do not have it. What he was asking for, these men did not have. I mean, think about it. Have you ever asked for something in particular? Have you ever been asked by somebody in particular for a certain something and you didn't have what they needed or have what they wanted? Sure. Or have you been the person who has asked for something before and what you've asked of someone, 
They didn't have to offer you or, or to give you the assistance that you needed. So put yourself in this man's shoes for just a moment. He was asking for a few coins. That's all he wanted. These few coins to buy a meal with or something. And Peter and John didn't even have a few coins to give him. But Peter didn't stop there. The next words out of Peter's mouth says, But what I do have, I give to you. What I do have, I give to you. Now again, the beggar, the lame beggar, asked for money. And they didn't have any. But then they tell him they will gladly give what they do have. Now what in the world could be more valuable for a beggar who is needing money than what he is asking for? So Peter and John, what did they have to offer this man? I could hear him underneath his breath probably saying, okay, you got money, what do you got? What do you got? What this man didn't realize is what Peter and John had to offer him that day was more valuable than silver and gold. Amen. A whole lot more valuable than silver and gold. What Peter and John had to offer that day was simply this. They offered this man Jesus. They gave this man Jesus. The text says here in verse number 6, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now when Peter states in the name of Jesus, church, it means that he is stating by the authority, by the power of and by the character of his name. So in Jesus' name, by his power, by his authority, and in his character to keep his promise, rise up and walk. Rise up. Something that he had never been able to do his whole existence. Rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. The Bible says that Peter took him by his right hand. He lifted him up. And immediately his feet and his ankle bones, which he was crippled by, automatically received strength. And notice this. The first thing that he did when he was healed, he leaped. He leaped. He's never done anything before, so the first thing he did, he jumped, church. He jumped. A man who had never walked in his life, the first thing he did was leap. And then after he leaped to his feet, the next thing he did was walk. And when he walked that day, he didn't walk with no limp. He had no limp at all. He didn't need a cane. He didn't need a walker. He didn't need no crutches. He learned that day all he needed was King Jesus. King Jesus. He was able to leap and walk because he placed his trust in the nail-scarred hand of Jesus that was offered to him that day. Not only did he leap, not only did he walk, but the Bible says that he went into the temple with John and Peter that day praising God for what he had done. What happens or what should happen when Jesus touches the life? There should be immediate joy. There should be immediate joy. And this beggar who was lame expressed this joy through great praise. Remember that this was the time of the what? Evening or afternoon prayer. And guess what those, as MacArthur would state, those stately ritual evening sacrifice and evening prayers were suddenly shattered by the loud uh, cries of joy and praise to King Jesus. What does this say about our lives as believers? Let's just stop right there for just a second. What does it say about us? Has Jesus touched your life as a believer? Has Jesus saved you? Well, if he has, where is the joy? Where is the praise for him in our churches today? Where is that? 
Oh, I got an inner joy. This man expressed it. He leaped to his feet. He walked in the temple and he was not silent about it. He says, look what Jesus has done for me. This man went to the church house that day rejoicing and praising God. How many of you came in here today just to rejoice and praise the Lord for what he has done for you? If he saved you, you got something to be joyful about. If he saved you, you have something to praise him about. If he's, if, if, if he's done these things in your life, you should rejoice today. I wonder, I just wonder if he walked into the temple that day, that beggar began to say, See, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus or houses or land. Yes, I'd rather be led by his nail scarred hand Amen. than to be king over a vast domain. Or to be held in sin's dressed way. I'd rather have Jesus than anything, even that silver and gold <coughs> that I thought I needed. You see, church, he didn't get what he wanted that day. He got what he needed. He didn't receive what he wanted. He received what he needed. But also notice something else. Not only was this man's life changed, the change was noticed by others. In verses 9 and 10, the Bible says that all the people saw him walking and praising God. Verse 10. And then they knew it was who? It was him who sat by the beautiful gate begging, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. A miracle had happened. The supernatural had happened. And these people saw it, and they witnessed it. I wonder if a little bit of prophecy was coming true here. Isaiah 35 states, the lame will leap like a deer. What did this man do? He leaped up because God had touched his life. How was it possible? They simply offered him Jesus of Nazareth. They simply offered him Jesus. Now again, the title of the message this morning is this. What do you and I have to offer? In the middle of verse 6, Peter and John said, this is what we have to offer. This is what we have to offer. So in our day, in our context, in our lives, what do we as the people of God in 2022, what do we have to offer others? I say this with all boldness. We have the same Jesus that Peter and John offered that day to share and give to a lost and dying world. Our world today and even some in the church house still thinks another dollar will fix their problems. It will not. Our world thinks that sex, a different relationship, uh, acceptance, the need for money, fame, fortune, drugs, alcohol, all of these things they try to stuff into their lives thinking this is going to fill their lives. And guess what? They're still desiring more and more and more and more because it will never ever satisfy or quench their thirst. Amen. But we, church, have what they need. We have something glorious to share if we will just give it, if we will just offer it to those around us. The man before us in Scripture today was born lame, but have we forgotten that all humanity is born crippled and lame by sin? Adam fell and passed this brokenness on to each and every one of us. This man before us in Scripture today was poor, and we as sinners are poor. We are bankrupt before an almighty and holy God. This man, when he was found, was outside the temple, and I want you to know that you and I are separated from God because of our trespasses and sin. <clears throat> Yet in His grace, the Father offers us Jesus. This man was made whole simply by the grace of God, and you and I are made whole by believing on Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We are made whole by believing on Him and Him alone. Not our works, not our church attendance, but on Christ alone. 
alone we can be made whole. So don't you see, as a body of believers, as a church, we have something wonderful, something grand to give our communities, to give our homes, to give our school system. Don't you see we have life to offer, life more abundantly? What we have to give is hope. What we have to give is peace. What we have to give is found only, only in the name of Jesus. Let me ask you a simple question. Why do you help those who are in need? Well, we're supposed to. That's what most people say. Well, it's the right thing to do. We help people as a church in hopes that help will point them to Jesus. Why do we have outreaches at our church? Well, to feed people a hamburger and hot dog, to give them some prizes, let them have a good time. No. The point of outreaches is to be a witness in hopes that they would receive Christ and they would never hunger nor thirst again. Oh, friends, why do we build wheelchair ramps? We built our 86th one as a church yesterday. If we're building ramps just to build ramps, anybody can do that. <clears throat> anybody. But we build ramps for one purpose. To be a witness for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yes, there are people who have physical needs that need help, but in helping that physical need, we can point them to their ultimate need. And that is found in Jesus Christ, our Lord. People need the Lord, the Lord. What we have to offer is priceless. You can't put a money amount on it. But the question is simply this. Will you offer what you have to offer? Will you give what you've already received? And what I mean by that is Jesus is in your life. He doesn't want you to, he does not desire for you to keep him bottled up in your life. He wants you to offer Him to your family, to your friends, to your co-workers, to those you come in contact with. What do you have to offer? If you're a Christian today, you have Jesus. And that's all you need to change the world around you. I told you all last week, and I've told you all several times, change is not going to come from the White House. But change can come from the church house. If people will begin to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the only one. They may make temporary um, uh, benefits or temporary results. Jesus gives everlasting results. He gives eternal results if we will just share them. So what do you have to give? If you're a believer today, you have exactly the same thing that Peter and John did. You have Jesus. Amen? You have Jesus. There's a story told of Roger Storms. He was the pastor of the first Christian church in Chandler, Arizona. He says that one Sunday a farm had broke down in the alley behind our church. And the driver had jacked up the car and crawled underneath to work on the car. He says suddenly we heard someone screaming for help. And the jack had slipped and the car had come down on top of the man. Someone shouted, call 911, and a couple of people ran for the phone. Several of our men gathered around the large car and strained to lift it off the trapped man. Nurses from our congregation were rounded up and brought to the scene. Somehow the men were able to ease the car's weight off the man, and he was pulled free. Our nurses checked him over. He was just scratched and shaken up, but otherwise he was okay. The pastor goes on to say, when this man was in peril, people did all they could do to help. When he was in peril, they did all they could do to help. Risking themselves, <coughs> inconveniencing themselves. Whatever was necessary to save the man physically, my church was ready to try. He goes on to say, how desperately we need this same attitude when it comes to rescuing those in the greatest peril, those in danger of losing life. What do you
do you and I have to offer? And what are you and I willing to give? Really, the only answer to that last question is this. His name is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today. We thank you for your love. We as a church, you have been redeemed, Lord. We thank you for that great sacrifice and how you have changed our lives. But Lord, there's still many. We sang a song a few moments ago, set our soul afire, Lord, because there's millions are groping in darkness. And there's only one light of the world who can take someone out of darkness into light. There's only one who has life and life everlasting that can bring somebody from death into life. There's only one who is burdened down with the sins of life, crippled by their sin, who can wash it all away and restore it, make it all new. And his name is Jesus. And that's what we have to offer here at Isabella Baptist Church. That's what we have to offer this community around us. We should be like Peter and John. Silver and gold, we might not have it. This is not saying we shouldn't help people in need. We should help people in need. We should help people buy food. We should help people put gas in their car. But ultimately, what we have to offer is the glorious news of Jesus Christ. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. So, Father, I pray that you'll bring conviction on our church's heart, Lord, to be ever about your business of sharing what we have to offer, and that is your Son. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.